Um, access all areas, I guess, is where uh, your career started off, and uh, the ability to be able to talk to these guys and photograph them on almost a kind of um, very serendipitous in a way. Um, how did you feel about it at the time? Did you, you did you feel that you were on a little bit of a trajectory and things that because these bands were at very early stages, some of them. Did you feel that you were going to take off and this was going to be it? Because mm, I think I felt nearly as um, sure of myself. It's only with hindsight that maybe one can look at those things. But yeah. but what is quite odd is that, um, which you can only sort of see in retrospect again, is that my father, I come from Zimbabwe. I was brought up in a small town in Zimbabwe. Mm-hmm. My parents were professionals. My father was an architect and my father's hobby was photography. And Mm -hmm. also before us kids came along, he used to play guitar in in a big band. Yeah, right. I never saw him playing guitar in a big band, but I think he he, he probably he he said to me he had something like a a Fender or a a Gibson guitar that probably would have been worth more than everything, you know, a 60s version anyway. And I've got a picture of him in my book, the moment of him actually playing. So in a strange way, I've. I my profession is his hob were his hobbies photography which he did very very well he was a really good photographer with a dark room at home and music yeah. so that's a bit peculiar in its own sort of way yeah so I can't say that I had a trajectory or 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 that when I you know fell in love with the Beatles that I ever really thought that I'd work with them but I I think that if you're if you're um, very focused and and on things that you really like, and you and you somehow have an urge to do that for the rest of your life, then then there's these little you know like I call them little crumbs that come along to sort yeah. of point you in a direction. Timing. Yes, and you were learning on the job, I guess, as well. Well, I certainly had to learn because I only ever I've only ever done a two week course in photography. Yes. Um, but I found actually quite a lot of the good photographers in rock archive also have, were untrained more or less. Yeah, and most of the musicians, remember, rock musicians are totally untrained. How did you get on with them? What sort of relationship did you have with them early on, early doors? But the the musicians, yeah, the first ones like the Pink Floyd's and the Led Zeppelins and the not the Stones really, but Mick Jagger, I suppose I had a little bit of dealings with. I'm trying to think of all those bands that played at the Rainbow: BB King, yeah. Eric Clapton, Pete Townsend, The Who. I had no relationship with them whatsoever, except that I had access to the backstage area as well as to the pit because I was a photographer there. Were you listening to their music prior mm, to that? Uh, well, that's yes, that's a, I, I was certainly a Floyd fan because I went to the Roundhouse and sat cross-legged and yeah. listened to Pink Floyd doing, I guess it would have been Echoes or something around that period of time. Yeah. In 1971, I was not a photographer. Yeah. I was 16 or something, yeah. 16, 17, and I went to gigs. Yeah. I really liked that kind of music. I also really liked reggae music too, but it didn't seem to be... Jimmy Cliff or a couple <laughs> of them reggae people used to come through occasionally. Yeah. But um, but I do remember actually uh, vividly um, somewhere around 1970, 71, going to a Led Zeppelin show and being at the front, um, I think it... It was a sitting gig. That's how I remember it. Anyway, yeah. I remember sitting. And I was within a sort of... I was on the edge of an area that was clearly for um, either the press or or their families. And it's like a, ca- a caged in front of stage area. Yeah. And I was on the edge of it. And I thought, how do I get in that cage? <laughs> how do I get closer? Hmm. And at the time, I was... I hadn't gone to art school yet. I'd done a course in shorthand and typing. And I thought I was doing Pittman shorthand in a notebook, and I thought, I wonder if they'll think I'm a journalist if I do a bit of Pittman shorthand in this. You know, I was I was looking for a way in. Yeah, I was looking for a way to have tea with the Beatles and Abbey Road. Yeah. I wrote a letter to Abbey Road, and they and I said I'm I'm at school, and I really want to go and see, <laughs> you know. And and they wrote a nice letter back saying, sorry, you can't. I was looking for something to get me a bit closer to it, but as to why, I'm not too sure. So maybe I was I was on the lookout unconsciously for yeah, and I guess if you were listening to the music as well, because if you photograph bands, you ha- kind of have to know their songs sometimes. Yeah, you know, know when they're leaning back off mic and all that sort of stuff. Yes. D- I mean, was that happening subconscious in your head when you were shooting, or, or, or were you 
um, uh, how did you approach a shoot? Mm. Well, I'm, I'm, I would say that actually I had a very poor record collection and that I was not actually that... When I think of all the rock journalists and their vast collections and their knowledge and who... Pl- I, I haven't a clue. You know, honestly, I, I, other than a few albums and a few right. bands, I didn't really. But as I also mentioned, I think, to Eamon on one of his questions, which was a very astute question, which is... I did that photography course, the two-week course that I'm talking about, and I was hooked on the very first roll of film. Yeah. I was so ready for it. And I had a couple of bullseyes. Yeah. You know, the next day at college, it was like, that's a great shot of that. That's another really great shot, and they were mine. And I was like, this is for me. Yes. So I, whilst, whilst I hadn't planned anything, um, and going in the dark room, I already knew the magic of that from watching my dad. I hadn't even gone in the dark room yet. Yeah. And I wasn't afraid to be in pitch black loading up the carousels, yes. which some students didn't like being in the pitch black. I had no problem with that at so all. So you had an empathy for the art form and for the music in a way because yes. of your dad. Yes. yes. Yes, exactly. And it all came together in a sort of an opportunity a week later. And that's what I'm saying. It's all rather strange. Mm. It is rather strange. And 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 it's carried on being strange for the last forty five years or something, <laughs> from time to time. What do you do? What do you shoot when you don't shoot rock bands? Um, I've been shooting constantly for the last few years with this um, Olympus thing, and before that, I used to carry a Leica around. So I do, I am shooting actually a lot, and don't look at it very much which is quite odd as well. So um, if you say, what are you shooting? I, I mean, I have, I've, it's split into different categories. There's, there's rock, mm-hmm. there's rock not, not rock. There's, there's rock, there's not rock. And in not rock is all my attempts at doing stuff that was outside of rock, which includes, I think I mentioned the Orange Order of Northern Ireland, yes. uh, which is a project set to me by a magazine. I, I don't know what the Orange Order was at the time at all, that project. Uh, visit to Peru where I won an award for landscape photography yeah. um, I do a little bit of landscapey stuff and flowers and that sort of thing just because it's quite nice I do pictures of my daughter when she was little I do pictures of friends and events that are around friends and then again on the professional side in the 80s when I when I moved away from rock a bit I worked on films doing stills for films mm-hmm. um, quite big films quite a few and also Portraits of people like Robert De Niro for Time Out, um, Nelson Mandela. I did a piece on the ANC. Right. Um, my picture of Nelson Mandela was used by the embassy when he was made right. president. A whole bunch of sort of. What was it like shooting De Niro? Well, it was fun, funny, <laughs> funny shoot with him. Because actually, I, I was uh, completely unfazed by him not being a film buff at all. Right. And um, the journalist was beside himself. He was, it was like meeting God for him. And for me, it was just, well, all right. And then I sat in on the, as one did, you sat in while the journalist was and you took your yes, snaps. Yes, But I had to do a cover. So, so the, you know, you've got a PR going, okay, you've got 10 minutes at the end of this and yeah. where do you want him? And I'm like, okay, and I set up a light and on the roof and I had 10 minutes and I'm, oh. and he came out and um, he was, he was, Awful. He was sort of giggling, and then, but but not in a way that was it was oh oh well I can't. And putting his hand, and I was going, and I remember thinking, and the PRs behind me going right. That's five minutes you've got, and I've got to get a cover for time out. And I went up to him and I said, I mean I went right up to him because he was like where you are, and I had my camera here, and I went right. And I said, now listen here, Robert. <laughs> I said I've got to get. I'm trying to do my job. I'm trying to get a decent picture of you for the cover. So you just. Just give me your attention. I can't remember the exact words. And I went back to the camera and I shot it. And it, he is full on. <laughs> and that was the shot. That was the cover. Um, but I'd been dealing with rock bands, you see. So I, I mean, an actor sort of being silly wasn't going to phase me too much. Yes, actors can be very silly. Yeah, actors can be very, very silly. silly. <laughs> I've wor- and I'd worked on films a bit as well. Yeah, what films did you work on? Uh, well, I worked with Christopher Hampton, the writer Christopher Hampton, yeah. who wrote um, a lot of film scripts like Dangerous Liaisons yeah. and so on. And, he did, and 
for yeah, some beautiful, uh, beautiful stuff. To beautiful shoot. stuff. Yeah, beautiful. I, I worked on, for example, the film Carrington with um, uh, Carrington had um, Emma Thompson playing uh, the lead uh-huh. and um, some other very big actors that became well known in, um, uh, or are. And then I worked on um, Secret Agent with um, Robin Williams, Gerard Depardieu, um, Bob Hoskins. Um, Quite a, quite a lot of yes. others that I can't sort of reel off at this yeah. moment. And then also writers like Harold Pinter. Right. Um, so Colin Thubron, Dervla Murphy. Um, sort of writers that I admired and stuff. I, I, and, and, um, and some very interesting fashion stuff. John Galliano, for example. Right, okay, wow. Because when I worked for The Face, they, suddenly it was all yeah. right, rock and fashion. And I'm like, okay, I'll do fashion, but... I know nothing about clothing, and I, I did a bit of advertising work. Oh, okay. um, now that was very interesting, the advertising because, I, and fashion as well, because I was used to chatting to you the subject that you're photographing. But in in the advertising, I remember doing. I, I had to do a lingerie ad, right? Um, for sort of, um, and um, and an art director came with a drawing. You know, I'm not used to that either. This is when I have my studio and I was trying to sort of... But the money was so good. And and um, the drawing was a girl lying on her back in a boat, trailing her hand in the water with sort of, you know, um, lotus um, yeah. flowers and what have you, uh, wearing the lingerie. And so she was lying. And in the picture that he'd drawn, her breasts were standing up. And, <laughs> and I said to him, <laughs> this art director, I said... When women lie down, the breasts are not going to be in that position. <laughs> so he said, "Well, we'll have to we'll have to raise the boat then." So so we had to build in the studio boat that was tilted like this, but from the camera angle, God. it looked like she was. So that was the first one, and then um, I said, "I've got this girl who'd be really good. She was one of my students. Is she thirty four B bust?" I said, "I don't know." I said, "But she's got a nice body, and it. How tall is she?" And I said. He's quite small. He said, no, it's got to be a blonde and about five foot eight. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So so then, then I had to interview girls for the lingerie. And cues of these girls from the model agency were all down the staircase. And um, and I'd be talking to them for too long. I'd go, oh, hello, nice to meet you. And <laughs> look, come, next, next. <laughs> so this is one of my experiences of trying to go outside of my music industry into other areas and learning a lot about photography yes and learning a lot about people i guess and learning well. a lot about people and and in fashion i learned pretty quick I, I had a sort of i took i took pictures of models i had no interest in clothes but you don't have to i was thinking well what does david bailey know about clothes he knows about girls yeah. i thought okay i don't need to know about clothes and there were all these gay stylists around and they did all of that so i did did some quite good shots and then i went to see the magazines like cosmopolitan i didn't go to vogue or any i just went to the Mm. women's magazines and then i realized i didn't stand a chance because the fashion editors were women the hairdressers were gay the girls were girls and they wanted a bloke they wanted a nice macho fashion photographer to you know address the balance and it wasn't really until corinne day came along and did kate moss and things and nick nick logan from the face brought her in that actually things started to change and women became involved in fashion. At that point when I was trying to see if I could get in, it was very much male photographers. Yes. Uh, um, Yeah, I guess, uh, and in the rock world as well, uh, did you have to develop sharp elbows, uh, Jill? Mm, I was certainly elbowed. I don't know about my being (laughs) sharp elbowed myself. Um, Funny enough, I've, I've, although I kind of, I've suffered from lack of confidence a great deal. Mm-hmm. That is thinking that I'm not very good or I don't know what I'm doing a great deal mm. or not good enough. I've never felt um, competitive or upset if other people do what I consider even better shots of the band than me. I'm thinking here of Oasis, for example, mm. that they became my group. Now, they became my group because the other photographer had been working with them had got into trouble by publishing a picture of Liam and some girl that he shouldn't have done. Yeah. So I and I knew this photographer and he's a nice guy. 
So they brought me in. I had nothing to do with it. They brought me in and I... And he was furious and he accused me of stealing his group, you see, which does happen, you know. The, yeah. So anyway, so I worked with Oasis, but over the period of time, sometimes they wanted to work with other people. And I always said, definitely do it. Because first of all, I, I've got my set of skills, but somebody else might give you a totally different look. Mm -hmm. And I don't mind, just as long as you, you know, if I want to shoot some pictures that you accommodate me, if you don't mind, because I'm, you know, documenting and... To this day, I get texts from Noel Gallagher saying to me, "Yeah, I'm playing with Paul Weller. Are you coming down?" Or, <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh, yeah, all right, I'll be there." Yeah. Because of that, I think because of my lack of, and also I work in rock archive with fifty photographers. Yes, and I'm a huge fan of of their work of rock photography in general. I find them fascinating. Yeah. I like their stories. Yeah. I interview them like you're interviewing me. I ask them questions. I want to know the answers. Um, I get very jealous when they go, oh, yeah, me and Bob Dylan, we did that. Oh, blast, lucky you. But not, not jealous in as, you know. <laughs> did you come to Bob Dylan? Um, you said you come to Bob Dylan late. Did you, uh, did you come to his music late or did you come to Bob Dylan late? Well, both, right? Both. Although, actually, I came to Bob Dylan sooner. It was the music. I just didn't like all that blowing in the wind stuff. and <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like all that. I thought the music that he wrote was really great, but preferably sung by somebody else or played by Jimi Hendrix or, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't like that whiny kind of voice very much, okay. whilst admiring him, obviously. Yeah. And also, I was never commissioned to work with Dylan because yes. I worked on commissioned work mainly, you know, because okay. do you want to go on the road with so-and-so? And you go, yes, yes, me, me, me. And sometimes you got the job and sometimes you didn't. Do you still own your archive? Well, obviously, you must do own your archive. Um, mm. uh, when you, Even when you were working for Melody Maker and all these other people, they didn't sort of um, acquiesce or uh, um, um, uh, say they owned your material when you were thank doing God commission? God, no. Thank God, no. I mean, we were very badly paid. Yes. But thank goodness we own the copyright. Yeah. And I mean, the journalists are very jealous of that now because, you know, they we make a living from our archives and they don't really. Yeah. Although there are there is a website called Rocks Back Pages that does a bit yeah. of it. Do you why do you reckon uh, bands don't want? Yeah, I mean, you know, three songs and out. Um, uh, why do you think they do that? What's the reasoning behind that? Do you sort of? Mm, no, I completely understand it in a way because. Well, Gilmore summed it up really in my book, The Moment, actually. He said, it's one thing to see one or two friendly faces that you know down there shooting away. Yeah. It's quite another that to have 150 of them, yeah, which yeah, is, at yeah. Glastonbury, it's more like 450 sometimes. It, I mean, God, 200 God. certainly at yeah. Glastonbury. It's a, it's a crowd yeah. all snapping away. I mean, I, I think that must be hugely intrusive. Yes. And so I did, I completely understood it. But, but um, having said that, um, here's somebody who ruined my my pictures. I, I photographed Bowie at the Rainbow hmm. in 1973 during his Ziggy Stardust yeah. period because he was playing there. And I had that Rainbow Pass that said Access All Areas and a bodyguard jumped off the stage or a security man, which they didn't really have in those days, came up to me and said, you're not allowed to photograph David Bowie. I said, I am, here's my pass. You know, during the gig... Hmm. He said, no, you're not. We are, we've got our own photographer. Opened the camera and pulled the film out. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was heavy stuff. And um, afterwards, I went backstage and the manager was there, but sort of blonde on each arm. He had a very unpleasant manager at that time of his... And I said, your bodyguard did this to me. And he said, oh, have this champagne, you know, like as if it was some sort of compensation. Yeah. And I later found out that was Mick Rock, the photographer, yeah. who was guarding his own territory, you see. Um, he, he said, well, I thought to myself, actually, I think I'll hang on to this one and um, I'll be your photographer and you don't need anybody else. And, you know, let, that'll protect the... So so that was the opposite of how I was. Yeah. I don't think I've answered your question, I think. No, 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 no. You asked fine. me something no, no, completely we, different. We, it just came we, to my head. You no, know, we go wandering off. Uh, the Bob Dylan sort of saga then yeah. is an interesting one. Uh, there's a story about Bob Dylan arriving at somebody's house. And yes. He, Dave's house. Dave's house. Dave's that house. is such an amazing story. Yeah, uh, well, I'll tell you a bit about Bob because um, just because it shows a little bit my personality and also because it was such a great story. So I 
with Dylan, I didn't have an interest during the 60s. Mm. But I photographed him with Dave Stewart, yes. the said Dave, yes. in 1985, actually. Right. So kind of that sort of new romantic era almost. And yeah. Fergal Sharkey. Oh, yes. Fergal, Fergal Sharkey, Sharkey from yeah. The Undertones was, <laughs> was doing a launch. And I don't know if David produced his album, but he was doing a sort of a, a showcase gig to which I was invited. And Dylan was sitting there with Dave Stewart. Right. And I thought, oh, great. Dylan. I, I had no interest in the music at this point, by the way. I'd only seen him once and thought... He wasn't very good. And Dave <laughs> Dave was, I said to them, I went up to them and I said, um, can I, uh, in fact, Dave introduced me because I knew Dave. And this very, very limp handshake, sort of like, you know. Ooh. And um, I said, can I take a picture? And Dylan goes, yeah, one. Right. So oh, I better get this right. I had a flash on the camera. Yeah. I stood back and I was thinking. And I pointed and he turned his head sideways to face Dave, you know, so it was like him yeah. looking at Dave and I shot the one picture and that was it. That was like I was dismissed. So that was my only dealings with him until um, Time Out of Mind came out in 1998, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I fell in love with that record. Yeah. Just loved it. Echoed my life at the time. There was something about it and I just loved it. Mm -hmm. And I just done that big oasis exhibition and i'd done four years with oasis and was ready to do something else and like zed looking for a project kind of thing yeah i thought bob dylan clearly you know his music has called me now so i must go to him and i really did feel a calling actually i really did i felt magnetized towards bob dylan had no idea how his setup worked but in the past i'd I thought it couldn't be that different to other people's. So I wrote to his manager because he was due to come to the UK on his endless tour. Yes. He was playing at Glastonbury, 98, and he was playing at Wembley. And I think he was even playing somewhere else. But anyway, so I bought a couple of tickets for Wembley. And, um, and then I thought, but I'll go to Glastonbury because I have good access at Glastonbury. They're always very nice to me there. And he was playing on the Sunday. And that Glastonbury wasn't as bad as this last one but it was almost as bad it was yeah. a washout yeah it was appalling it was a disaster area it was awful and i'd been there actually it glassed me on the friday and had to, i thought i can't stand it i'm coming home i'll go and see bob dylan at wembley on the saturday that's yeah. right and something happened with the tickets i can't remember exactly what happened but as a result of whatever happened i couldn't go and see him at well i would have just been in the crowd i couldn't have, i couldn't go to wembley I thought, well, I'll have to go to, back to Glastonbury. I thought you were out of... I, I was talking to myself. I was thinking, you're mad. It's, it's raining. You've already been there. You've seen how awful it is. And it's rained all the time. There was a gale blowing that night. And I thought, you're out of your mind. But I still went. Yeah. And in wellies and everything, I arrived at the station. The taxi said, well, I can't get you on the site. I'll take you as far as Pill, I think it was, right. which is on the outskirts. And then I walked through the mud with my bags and my wellies and everybody was coming the other way trying to get out and I was going in. It was apocalyptic. It was biblical. You know, I felt like people were... <laughs> uh, a few kind people gave me like a cup of tea on the way in. It took me about 45 minutes or an hour to get into the site. And then I went... I had a um, press pass. I went into the backstage area and they said to me, oh, Bob Dylan's bus has got stuck... Uh, but Michael Evis has gone to fetch him, you know, in his Land Rover because it was really it was a disaster. And I went to see John Peel, who's a, who was a friend of mine, yeah. and Jules Holland is also a friend of mine. They were in the BBC area, yeah. which was bordering on the um, uh, um, the dressing room area, which were porter cabins at the time. So I was standing there and blow me down but the bloke and I didn't have any passes other than this uh, yeah. media pass blow me down but the bloke on the gate of the um, uh, dressing room area was an oasis um, security man he's going oh you're here that's great are you coming in I went well I haven't got any passes oh no I, come in <laughs> so I came in just as Bob Dylan was arriving actually um, rescued by Michael Evis and I had a copy of my book The Moment on me because I felt as though I was going to make contact with him. This was entirely instinctive, really. Mm. When I got into that backstage area, there was a lady there who is to this day, 40 years later or 30 years later, never forgiven me. She said to me, 
You're not allowed in this backstage area to, to take pictures, put your cameras away. There's no photography for Bob Dylan. So, okay, no problem, I'll put my cameras away. In a, a secure place in that area. But I had the book the moment, right? So then um, Dil- um, I'm standing talking to this security bloke and Dylan um, comes by and is going to his dressing room, which was a porter cabin. And as he walked past me, I went up to him and said, I'd like to give you a copy of my book. Oh, thank you very much, he said. And, you know, and he was quite gracious and he went off to his porter cabin. I was thinking, oh, that's good. I've done that now. About 10 minutes later, he came out, came to talk to me. Wow. And and that's how the Bob Quest began, and uh, we had a whole chat. And um, what did you talk about? Well, he said to me, "Oh, a photography book. That's great." He said, um, "He said I could use a good photographer." And I said, "Oh yes, you could," because I'd seen t- the cover of Time <laughs> Out of Mind, which was a blurred picture, and I thought I could do better than that at least. And and also, he asked me to take him for a walk around the site. I said, well, I don't think that's a good idea, Bob. I mean, look, I was covered in mud, you know. And I said, in your, I said, I, I, I wouldn't advise it. I said, it's really bad out there. And all that. You know, it was that kind of a conversation. Uh, he said to me, did you write me a letter? Now, this I've never quite understood. I thought, my God, did that manager pass the letter on to him? But I don't know if that was the case or not. But I subsequently became very friendly with this manager. And I, he was the sort of manager who might well pass on a letter. And I think my letter said something like, I've never been a fan of yours, but I really <laughs> like Time Out of Mind. <laughs> and apparently he likes that too. Wow. So anyway, I don't know if he got it or not, but the long and short of it is he said, I said to him, yes, you could use a good job. And he said, he said, well, do you want to take some pictures? So I said, yeah. He said, well, on the stage? I said, yes, please. I said, but um, you better tell the, all these security people because otherwise I'll be like a cannonball. I'll be flung out in a second. Um I said, OK. So he, he went and told somebody he was his personal. And, and um, so th- so then I went to the backstage to retrieve my cameras from this woman who's never forgiven me. And she said to me, you can't have your cameras back. I said, I can. She said, no, you can't. There's no photographs of Bob And I said, he just said, ask me to photograph. <laughs> and she was like, no, he didn't. I said, and then this bloke came and he said, yes, he did. She handed the cameras to me and she said, but you don't, you're not even supposed to be here. You haven't got a backstage access or anything. You know, you're, you're an intruder in here. <laughs> I said, oh, well, sometimes it's like that. You know, what can you say? Yeah. And then yeah. I did follow him. There's a shot I regret not taking. He was standing in the doorway of the porter cabin in his wellies <laughs> looking out, <laughs> which I thought was brilliant. But I thought, no, don't shoot just yet, Jill. Just wait. Don't shoot that. Oh, I should have shot it because I never got another chance to shoot that again. But... I went on stage with him and then that his own people couldn't believe it, that he'd invited me to do so. So I didn't find that peculiar, but I didn't realise then that he was very strange about those things. And and obviously your book had an impact on him then. I don't know. In retrospect, I think I had an impact on him because I think he picks up women on these, you know, this is uh, but only in in retro, retro, retrospect. I think. Probably I was a bit more nubile then than I am now, and he probably thought I was quite cute, actually. Really? Well, I think that might have been part of it anyway. Yeah. Um, but subsequent to that, um, I, I took these... Uh, and he said to me, if, if you take pictures, can I see them? You're not going to just pop... I said, yeah, I'll send them to your office, yeah. which I did. And his manager was delighted because he, he said, well, actually, he doesn't usually allow pictures. Yeah. Ray Davis, I'll tell you a little story, one of my Go little on, stories. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I do the uh, Lan Literary Festival and I come there, official photographer, and all these l- lovely people arrive. And Ray Davis arrived, and I knew he didn't like having his photograph taken. And I said, Mr. Davis, I, I'd really like to do a portrait. I set up a little studio, mm. and I'd really like to do a portrait of you. And he said, oh. And I said, Oh, fair enough. And he came up to me, he held both my hands, and he said, Thank you very much. And I thought, oh, Shame, but there we are. And I was in the green room. And lots of people are coming and going. And uh, he suddenly turned to me and he said, you remind me of a good friend of mine, uh, Thomas Johansson. And I thought, oh. right, OK, yeah. Um, and um, so he didn't say anything else. And then about five minutes later, he turned to me, you can take a photograph of me now. And he went and he sat in the seat and I took six shots of him. And they were absolutely delightful. Oh, wow. And you should put one in Rock Archive, actually. It'd be nice. It's to have. A abs- that's an absolute beaut. Put one in Rock Archive. 
I'm I would delighted love to, to have that because um, I don't think we've got a nice portrait of Ray Davis. And he's he one insisted of the on doing this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that was fine, you know. And it, it, it was, uh, it, it, I don't know. It's. I love shooting bands, but shooting bands is really quite hard. I find it's, uh, and I'm getting on a bit. So, um, and I find it. Um, but I enjoy the process. Some there, there's, there's a, a, there's a, you kind of feel that you're part of the act somehow. Mm. Did you feel that? You yeah, see? yeah, and also it's a, um, it's a, I consider it as like a meditation actually. Yeah. Um, shooting bands, I still, you know, still like it. I think maybe the best of all because. I like them doing. They, you go and do your, get on the stage and do your thing, and I'll do mine. Just don't bother yeah. me. If you let me get on with it, I'll do a really good job for you. And and then I go into some sort of zone. I don't even hear the music really. Yeah, hardly hear it. You're just in a zone, and and um, and it's just the most wonderful kind of yeah. thing. I really like. I still really love to. Shoot. You were shooting a lot of. Uh, British bands mm. uh, was was the did the opportunity ever arise to shoot a lot of people in America or did that ever happen uh, sort of people wanting you to shoot there or? yeah I mean you got to do quite a bit of traveling when you worked for the music press you yeah. didn't you didn't get to see see much but you did a quite a bit of traveling and you'd vie for those jobs because well they would be a chance to actually get much better material when you're all away together and you've got the marmite out and you know and all that sort of thing yeah. um so i did travel quite a bit and in the st including in the states and work with quite a few american bands you know um like blondie i suppose and um i'm trying to think of the bands that i work with in the states um i certainly traveled there a great deal you know sort of including Early um, rap music like Africa Bambata right, and okay. um, and yeah, all that. How did of... you find that scene when it first kicked off? I didn't understand it at all, actually. Yeah, but it was all. It seemed to be hi this hip hop stuff that was going on first in America. It yeah. seemed to start from the Puerto Rican community of New York, yeah. from what I could see. Yeah, and I just happened to be there, and it was really quite early. I mean, it was. I think it was you know sort of late seventies, early eighties when it was starting. Actually, when I think about it now. I think but African Bambata 84, I think I photographed him. And they were all playing these clubs, you know, and they were on the decks and everything. I was thinking, oh, where's, the, where's the live music? This is... And <laughs> even with Wham, actually, and George Michael, right. Wham, I like, they haven't got any musicians playing with them. They're playing in these discos and they're singing to backing tracks <laughs> with dancers. And I thought, well, what's that all about? You know, I found it extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. And as for rapping, I mean, my daughter's 50 Cent and all, you know, yeah. and I thought Eminem was pretty good, but yeah. I've never, never. And Beyonce, my little picture I showed yeah. of those girls from the hood, you yes. know, it was a real attempt to sort of unglamorize yeah. um, that whole world, which seems a bit. If you, if you had, uh, that sounds like a cheesy question, and it is a cheesy question. If you um, wanted to shoot anybody who's on the scene now, who would you really like to get your teeth into as a photographer? Oh, I don't know, really. I mean, that from... I'd actually quite like to do Adele. I went to Glastonbury to do Adele this time, but there was no photographers allowed, and I... That, do you know that very woman who stopped me with Bob? <laughs> no, she was there. <laughs> She's always there. She, everybody at Glastonbury's been there forever. You know, Michael Evis's staff go back about 40 years. Can you believe it? She thwarted me this time as well. Right. Uh, she didn't thwart me for Dylan because I got through that one. But actually, every year I try to get them to give me an all access. Yeah. And this year, for some reason, I didn't get it together. And I had last year's pass, which looks the same as, uh, they, you know, if to most security, they can't tell. Yeah. But she, <laughs> <laughs> she, her job is to stop people going into the dressing room areas and especially from photographing them. And this year, she happened to see me just when Adele was... I was going to go and speak to Adele's manager, who I know through various... I was going to say to Adele's manager, look, come on, come on, come on let me do... Um, and she said to me, where's your pass? Now, I thought, I'm not pulling out the one from last year because I'll be out of my ear and she might take it off me and then I'll have to go to all the awful toilets that are not in the backstage area. I'm not going to give her that. <laughs> so I said, I, don't, I, haven't, I haven't got the one that you probably looking for this year. And she said to me, well, what are you doing? Back to that, you know, what are yeah. you doing here? 
I said, well, madness brought me in, which they, which they certainly did. Yeah. She said, well, you'll have to leave. <laughs> so I was out. Do you know her name? <laughs> <laughs> no, but she's got a daughter now who's, you know, equally. Anyway, I mean, this is what I'm saying. Oh, it's, it's, a, uh, it yeah, a, family it's a family thing, thing at Glastonbury. Yeah. So you can see that actually there's a part of me that kind of I slightly gets off on this kind of conflicting situation because it brings out a sort of punky um, <laughs> Keith Richardsy, you know, thing in me. Yeah. Um, and I don't know why I'm slightly addicted to that as well. It's probably not a very good thing at my age. <laughs> In fact, at one point with Bob Dylan um, on the Bob Quest, I was I was um, in the wrong place. So I shouldn't have been there. And his manager had become a friend of mine. He said to me, now, Jill, I know you were at that sound check because the security spotted you there. He said, and they had to throw you out. He said, that's not very dignified for a woman of the year, <laughs> you know, um, 19, whatever it was, and a woman of your age. And I said, you know what, you're right. I'm not going to do it anymore. Not to Bob Dylan anyway. Big groups, big stages, big lighting, big. Have you ever been tempted to do the kind of really intimate stuff, little jazz clubs and mm. all that sort of stuff? Because I, I loved some of your jazz work. Mm. Oh, was... thank you, yeah. In a way, not really, because that kind of music, strangely enough, isn't my favourite right. kind of music. Okay. Having said that, you know, Jeff Buckley yes. um, oh, in that no, little club, yeah. you know, that it's not it's not the size of the venue that puts me off particularly. But I sort of feel maybe even that the jazz era, yeah. just like the rock and roll era, kind of had its moment. I, I caught the end of it, you know, the end of Miles Davis's career, the end of yeah. Duke Ellington's career. I know that people still do jazz, yeah. but people also still do impressionist paintings, but they're not Monet or Manet. No. And I think that... It didn't catch my imagination, perhaps, the jazz yeah. field. Although, actually, to photograph it is very nice. Yeah. But to, but it doesn't sort of... it. Charlie Watts, of course, is the he's other still, way. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, he still does jazz. He absolutely he? still does. And, and then people like Dr John, who are on the, yeah. on the cusp, are also nice. To, I like yeah. that music very much, too. Um, so no, I haven't really. Uh, and it was, I was, I was really glad you had a picture of Captain Beefheart. Oh, lovely! Wow, what? Because uh, I had the Trout Mask replica album, which was one of my. Everybody thought I was mad listening to that stuff, but it was, yeah. he was something else. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. And uh, Anton Corbin did fantastic images of him when he went to live in the desert. Right. Oh, great. Right. Yeah. Oh. yeah. It's wonderful. Oh, yeah. and um, I, 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 I'm sounding thing now, but the Leonard Cohen shot as well, because Leonard Cohen is one of my favourites. Mm, me too. And I think Leonard Cohen, his current stuff is as fantastic. Oh. As he's one of those artists that's really gone. And I think some of Paul Simon is also really yeah. great that he's doing now. Yeah. There are some that are still, you know, that are, they've taken it all the way through. Neil Young is another one. Yes. You know, not all of it, but there's still great stuff coming out of those people. Yes. So, yeah. And and there's always young, talented people. I mean, Adele I'm quite interested in. Yeah. I just quite fancied... Um, I'm trying to think if if there's anybody else. I think Drake is quite an interesting bloke. He's yeah. he's um, one of the younger generation sort of rapper yeah. as a character, I find him. You've got to fall in love sometimes with just the person. I fell in love with the whole Sinead O'Connor thing at one point. Yeah. I hadn't even heard a note she'd played. I just thought she's got cropped hair she's had a terrible background she's as beautiful as sin i mean she's mm. sensational and she's nervous and says stuff and i thought i want to definitely want to work with her yeah i hadn't heard anything she'd done well at that point when i saw her yeah subsequently she she really ended up with only a few things and she still gets into terrible trouble and she's a very troubled soul yeah. but one's inclined to to find these characters in in uh, music and and yeah. um, and and find them very attractive. Yeah, I mean, uh, you were talking about the Gallagher brothers. You, see, you could see the tensions within, um, because they live in bubbles, really, don't they? Mm. These guys, and that that must be difficult in uh, in itself because um, they need to exclude people, but they need also need people to bring in in order to to further their careers I guess did you uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you was uh, did you I mean did you have any disasters early on that you went to a gig and you got nothing oh yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah all got thrown out 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Probably if, quite a lot, really. And certainly when when I first started using flashes and things like that, I didn't know what I was doing. Even yeah. a couple I showed tonight were yeah. very poor quality, really. The first studio shoot I did, I hadn't synced up the flash with the camera. Oh, God, yeah, shooting right. it. You know, you had to shoot it to 60th or yeah, under or yeah, something, yeah, didn't yeah, you? 125, yeah. That's maybe. That's right, yeah. And I must have been shooting it. And it 125 nothing with came a flash, out. really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I had a lot, of, a lot, a lot of disasters. I put the fix in before the dev, right. um, retriculation, um, the wrong, uh, the thermometer not working properly, <laughs> the assistant not replenishing something, and so on and so on and so on and so on. Yeah, how long has Rock Archive been going now? Okay. Since 1998. Right. Okay. So there's a lot of stuff then. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm very proud of the fact that it exists. Actually, that it still exists. I was talking to David Hearn, uh, Hearn because. Yeah. It was inspired by Magnum, yeah. But I've had, unlike Magnum, which is you know the responsibility was spread. I've had all the responsibility. Yeah. So it's been a heavy burden actually. <laughs> yeah. But the idea was to have an archive of archives, so okay. that the so that the cultural history of rock and roll would would be there to be found and seen. Yeah. And I've also banged on a great deal about the fact that we do not have a rock and roll repository for want of a better word a museum in the UK yeah and both attempts to do it have been utter disasters and nobody bothered to ask me what should they should do which they should should do and so actually um so David I said to David your archive what's going to happen well it'll go into magnum it'll be a foundation what about my archive what about Nick Rock's archive and what about Penny Smith's archive and so, of course, a lot of these archives will leave the country. They'll be sold privately. They'll be bought. And there is nothing. I mean, OK, you can probably ask the National Portrait Gallery to take it, but they've got all their other stuff. Yes. And similarly, do you, the exi- do you exhibit at all? Does the you exhibit as well? We exhibit all the time. We we're only do printing, you see. We yes. Make prints. So we've got a Bowie exhibition on at the moment in Brixton mm-hmm. with um, Photofusion which is a which is an educational institute actually yeah, in yeah. Brixton um, we do stuff at the Teenage Cancer Trust in in the Albert Hall um, we curated a 50 years of British rock and roll for the British Council um, I've just done a punk exhibition called Chunk of Punk in the Barbican um, I'm doing um, an Oasis exhibition in the Manchester Library Wow so we do we can individually and as a and as, as a collective, a collective yeah. and I think that's why I'm saying actually we should really be lottery funded actually yeah, yeah. and the mistake is that we try to make it profitable which it's never been actually <laughs> we've succeeded in it not being profitable but really it should have been a lottery funded um, public um, owned yeah. or public interest yeah. situation and that's the problem now is there's not much of that sort of thinking yeah, uh, um, it's uh, it's a great shame, really, mm. because um, I mean you have uh, in America you have, uh, Hall of Fame, yes. etc., and yes. they look after their archives. I mean, I remember going to the um, uh, Library of Congress, and they keep all the stuff. It's amazing. This. Absolutely. Well, I, it could be that all our archives will end up in America, and that is why I started Rock Archive. Right. They they could all end up in America. Okay. Because there's nowhere to put it here. Right. There is nowhere to put it. And it's no good saying, OK, we'll put it in Sheffield, which they tried to do. Because in Sheffield, I think they spent millions on a building and had no money left to put anything in it. And nobody wanted to go to Sheffield anyway. No, no, it's no. got to be in London or maybe Manchester. I don't know. Yeah. Where it is is important, I think. It should probably be in London. Yeah. And it it should, you know, they've got a, a museum of punk in Washington when the, there was no punk in Washington as far as I know <laughs> so we haven't got any we had yeah. the British music experience which was up the back of the O2 three flights up and um, with lots of toys for boys, push buttons and go on the internet and then you'll get a card and then you know, just no dignity whatsoever given to the subject no. what has happened though is with the Bowie exhibition at the V&A the Floyd exhibition coming up at the V&A and Saatchi exhibition at the Rolling Stones is that people are going, blimey, queues around the block, you know, uh, yeah. having to open extra hours, people flying in from other countries. Oh, quite. And even with the punk ex- thing, it was 40 years of punk mm. and um, Boris Johnson or whoever it was, 
agreed to put 100 grand, which is not very much. None of it came to Rock Archive, none. And I worked with a Barbican librarian who's a vinyl junkie. And between us, we put probably the best exhibition together of punk wow. just ourselves with yeah. my funding yeah. and his record collection. Right. That has travelled around a bit. And I'm a bit fed up with it, really. And But Rock Archive, the new website for Rock Archive, would be a little bit more to emphasise this historic side because... Mm. Because actually, it's a historic cultural resource. Yeah. You interviewing photographers, we do it too. Yeah. And we've lost a few. We've lost the Beatles photographer, Terry Spencer. We've lost uh, the Elvis photographer, Al Wertheim. And luckily, I spoke to them. And, um, but I can't do it on my own. And, um, and, and, I, and I'm not looking at my own archive while I'm looking at other people's work all the time. Maybe Dolan will back you. Maybe he will, actually. Yeah. It's not a bad idea, actually. He'd probably be more likely to do that than yeah. sit for a picture for me, yeah. bastard. 